And uh, I, I would like to turn this into a discussion where it's not a discussion of why it can't be done, but more what we really need to achieve so that we can get it done. Because we're clearly in a very exciting time uh, from the standpoint of treatment of thoracic aortic disease. And uh, as my uh, previous um, colleague got up and, 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 and discussed, we continue to, to push the envelope and, uh, and continue to move our way around the aortic arch. And eventually, we're going to make it all the way around. So, what I'd like to talk today about is ascending an aortic arch repair and the potentially, but not necessarily, insurmountable challenges of zone zero. Um, am I the person there? Does it matter that there's no? No. didn't pay ABT enough money this year. This also happens every year, by the way. It makes me look like a fool. No, it's not you. It's Sally fault. This should this is the worst one. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm going to be mentioning mentioning some uh, some company names during this talk, and I. Just like to make it clear that I don't have any financial disclosures to uh, to share. Um, you've seen this before, but this is the sort of the map that we look at, and these are the different zones of the aortic arch, and each of these particular zones has with it a particular challenge that must be met with regards to uh, treatment of aortic disease that involves them, and some are easier than others, and uh, and and the degree of difficulty increases as you move from zone four towards zone zero. But, the important thing, of course, is that we always have to uh, adhere to the basic principles that we want to get safe vascular access, we want to have secure fixation of the endograft, we want to form a hemostatic seal, and we must always take patient device and technical considerations into account to achieve this result. And that's no different for this particular, um, this particular anatomy. Now, for zones three and four, it's very straightforward. You have a straightforward descending thoracic aortic aneurysm. You have good proximal and distal landing zones. Presumably, your, your patient has good vascular access. You take your graph, you deploy it, you inflate a balloon proximally and distally, you get a good seal, and you're done. This is relatively straightforward, and uh, it's also worth saying that, that, that these particular aneurysms are not very common. Um, I see very few of these in my practice. I, I get very excited when I see these aneurysms in my practice because I know I can offer a patient uh, a very easy solution that we can do in a, a relatively short period of time with a short hospital stay. But the fact is, th this is just not the anatomy we see that often with descending thoracic aortic aneurysms. What we see are aneurysms that extend into the aortic arch to various d degrees. And as Dr. Hakeem discussed, there are <clears throat> different approaches to dealing with these, and some of them are, uh, are listed here. Open web design, um, occlusion of left subclavian, Fenestrations, stents, and branches, hybrid techniques, and open debranching. Here we are now moving into zone two, and zone two means the left subclavian artery. Early on in, in, in our experience with endovascular stent grafting, particularly in trauma, we felt that you could cover the left subclavian with impunity. And the only time you really had to worry about it is if there was um, a type two uh, endo leak, as seen here, in which you probably needed to do something about that. But um, we have, there is data in the literature that warrants to the contrary, and I'm sure many of you are aware with the, of the Eurostar data, which basically shows that in patients who have um, descending thoracic aortic uh, endovascular procedures, not providing an alternate route of flow down the subclavian is associated with increased risk of spinal cord um, and neurologic complications. Um, this one slide shows. Uh, in the first column that of the cases of paraplegia and stroke, uh, they were all managed without any transposition or bypasses, and those that were did not have those. In multivariable analysis, if you look uh, four down at the point zero two seven four, um, left subclavian artery covering without transposition or bypass was associated with an independent predictor of neurologic complications. So, so many endovascular um, surgeons uh, have a relatively low threshold for carotid subclavian by bypass for this reason. And uh, um, as also mentioned, there are certain contraindications 
that must be observed, such as patent internal mammary artery, complete circle of Willis, um, uh, et cetera, which have to be taken into account in the evaluation of these patients. Other novel approaches to this include a retrograde stenting of a, sep a separate graft up the left subclavian artery. Um, and then uh, new technology, which is coming, coming uh, but is still investigational, and I have permission from the, from the Gore folks to show some of this, is, uh, is an endovascular stent graft that has a side branch that can be deployed through the stent graft. And here's an example of some of what the deployment steps would be like. It's, it's actually relatively straightforward. Uh, one inserts guide wires in both the aorta and the branch vessel through the graft. Um, the, uh, the aortic component is then introduced uh, and positioned within the arch. The, uh, the aortic component is then deployed, the catheter is withdrawn. The next sheath is, is, is uh, deployed into the left subclavian and then that branch component is then also deployed. So you can see here, for example, that we have uh, two guide wires going up, one into the arch, one into the left subclavian, both through the graft. There it is there. The branch is then advanced and deployed. An introducer is then placed across the, uh, the opening uh, for, the, uh, for the second graft. And then that graft is deployed. So it seems relatively straightforward. But again, it's worth stressing that this is investigational. It's not FDA approved. It's not available. But it's something that's coming down, and down the pike. And I think this, this is a type of technology that we're going to need to, uh, to be a lot safer uh, with these sorts of procedures. We uh, talked uh, we was, uh, the, the concept of fenestrations has already been discussed, and these have potential utility in the arch. Deep branching is, uh, is em employed in, uh, in higher specialized centers to, uh, to get grafts farther along the aortic arch. And here's an example of a carotid carotid bypass with then a carotid left subclavian bypass to allow extension of the stent graft all the way to the level of the innominate artery. Here's a, a, con a conceptual depiction of the so-called chimney graft procedure of two grafts placed into the left common and the left subclavian. Um, and then crimped around a, a larger graft, which I think, uh, and then one in the le uh, left common and, and nominate. I think very interesting technology. 